Okay, dear colleagues, uh, I'm pleased to welcome you on behalf of both co-organizing organizations, the Pontifical Academy of Sciences and the Scientific Group for the UN Food Systems Summit. The objectives um, of the UN Secretary General's Food Systems Summit are rooted in the Sustainable Development Goals, especially goal number two, which includes ending hunger and sustainable production and consumption. The summit shall mobilize actions to make food systems more inclusive, climate adapted, climate neutral and resilient. So the objective of our workshop derives from these goals of the summit. It is us to identify evidence-based actions with a focus on science, technology, and institutional innovations that can move us towards a more sustainable food system. We bring into this workshop basic scientists from different disciplines together with applied scientists. We do that for a reason. The reasons are that the growing complexity of food systems and the growing opportunities of all sciences to address the food system problems. For instance, biology addressing basics of plant science, biodiversity, medical research relating to nutrition, chemistry exploring atmosphere and climate change, physics and mathematics relating to artificial intelligence, algorithms, and space science. So food systems need interdisciplinary science. The background materials for this workshop are, <clears throat> are many. There are seven papers from the scientific group peer reviewed on the, on the website of our uh, food uh, system summit. Um, we cover concepts of um, uh, food systems, healthy diet, food for all, sustainable consumption, nature positive production, equitable livelihoods, and resilience. There are background materials from the Pontifical Academy too, recently published volumes on climate change and health, food safety and healthy diets, food waste and loss reduction, protection of species and biodiversity and others. The Inter-Academy Partnership, represented here by uh, the President, recently has strongly engaged in these issues, and we note a global and four regional papers as background materials shared with you just a few days ago. Our challenge is to come to a strategic aggregation of conclusions on all of this and other materials that can establish policy priorities for the Food Systems Summit, strategic aggregation. Otherwise, we will lose the attention of um, senior policymakers. That requires also our consultations with stakeholders in civil society, government, and private sector. This workshop, by the way, uh, is recorded, and I ask you to accept it. And as usual for the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, the deliberations will be placed on the YouTube channel of the Academy, which is visited from all over the world. So we are completely transparent. Tomorrow, we will share a draft outcome statement of the workshop with you, asking for all of your inputs. We will give you a few days to um, to review, comment, and change this draft, which we will introduce to you tomorrow afternoon. And then when approved, um, endorsed, uh, we will make it public. So I underline YouTube channel statement, make it public. We are not here just to discuss and enjoy the conversation among ourselves. We are here for a purpose to um, generate impact from a science perspective for the Food System Summit. I now ask uh, Bishop Chancellor of the Pontifical Academy, uh, His Excellency Monsignor Marcelo Sanchez Sorondo to address us. Marcelo 
is from Argentina originally. He is a noted scholar of philosophy, in particular on Aristotle and Hegel. Marcelo, you have the floor. Thank you, President. Uh, I welcome these people. It's okay. It's okay. Go ahead. We don't want to have this. Uh, yeah, this uh, child when somebody joins, there will be more. Can you switch it off? Please go ahead, Marcelo. Uh, it's not an option. Go ahead. I welcome all the participants and I'm very happy to see very friends, old friends that we work together for many years. Uh, to this important workshop addressing the food and hunger problems. I would particularly like to thank our present very active, Joachim von Braun, who has contributed personally, really, to the organization of this webinar. Please excuse me for my professional deformation, but as philosopher, I would like to quote it from Aristotle, who said that, I said, we cannot continue to exist when we are deprived of food. There are three separate factors in the food. The thing feed, the means by which it is fed, and the feeding agent. The feeding agent is the soul in the primary sense. The thing feed is the body, which contain the soul and the means by which it is fit is the food. Uh, close the quote, and it's uh, from the anima. This sort of observation makes us realize that food sustains the body, but according to Aristotle, it is primary for the soul, the food for the soul. When we ask God to give us our daily bread in our prayer pattern. We are asking him to feed our body, but also to feed our soul. Also, soul meaning the human dignity, the dignity of a person. Nevertheless, we should not think that asking God to give us our daily bread is sent us from working to obtain the food. St. Paul in his letter point out that if anyone is unwilling to work, he shall not eat. Therefore, on the one hand, we see the importance of food for our body, but also for our spirit. And on the other hand, we need to work and to have the possibility to work, to do so. In many cases, as the Chinese proverb goes, it is necessary to teach a man to fish instead of giving him one. Our workshop must serve to become more and more aware of the importance that food has for our body, but also for our soul. Of the 8 billion people of, of the earth, that more or less are the quantity of people that we have today in our planet. Especially, especially in this situation of the pandemic, when we have heard that some 80, 100 million of people are in their situation of hunger and of the importance of giving people the possibility to work, to gain the food that sustain our body, soul, and dignity. The lack of action to end hunger is a major concern for our academy for many years, but especially in this last time. And of course, it's a concern of, for Pope Francis, and so, the prevalence to unhealthy diets and obesity that we study in our meetings and the 
environment destruction is a real problem for Spain. Pope Francis made a very concrete proposal that maybe we can to put in our conclusion by saying that a courageous decision will be to set up a global fund with the money used in arms and another military expenditures in order to definitively eliminate hunger and contribute to the development of the poorest countries. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, so food for not just for body, but also for human dignity and so and a concrete proposal from Pope Francis, which he actually tabled at last World Food Day uh, at FAO. Um, colleagues, uh, we have a very tight schedule. Let me go now on uh, you, Werner, Werner Aber, president of the, this academy uh, until May 2017. So Werner is my predecessor. Um, he's, uh, from the field of microbiology and biological evolution, the Nobel laureate for, in physiology of 1978. Um, Werner, I'm happy to greet you from your academy. Um, um, other than most of you, Marcelo and I are sitting comfortably together in Casina Pio in the Vatican Gardens. I'm sure you envy us. But uh, these are the days. Werner, you will speak uh, about um, um, the impact of bioscience on the human health and principles of global food systems. Werner, you have 10 minutes. According to archaeological studies, life on our planet Earth must have started 3,500 million years ago with single cellular microorganisms. By stepwise ongoing biological evolution, a rich diversity of microorganisms and multicellular living organisms resulting in populating nowadays our planet. Uh, Berna, can you adjust your camera a little bit? We see your eyes and now we see you beautifully. Okay. okay, good, that's fine. Uh, all these different organisms find their required nutrition in their environments. We are aware that biological evolution is steadily ongoing by various natural mechanisms. These act in part internally in the genome of each species whereas other specific mechanisms act by occasional horizontal gene transfer between different kinds of individuals. In order to secure an ongoing successful evolution for future developments of living organisms, it is essential to prevent impacts on planet on our planet, leading to a stepwise loss of the currently available rich biodiversity. As far as we know, Homo sapiens became by its stepwise biological evolution, a highly intelligent organism on our planet. This allowed our ancestors to reflect by so-called thought experiments on the possible origin of their environment and of their own existence. This resulted at different sites on our planet to formulate still available creation myths. An example is the chapter Genesis in the Old Testament. At the same time, about 10,000 years ago, some tribes 
started to domesticate some animals and some plants as means to facilitate their daily need of nutrition. This was the start of agriculture. We can view the development, this development as the beginning of today's human civilization. During the course of the last few centuries, scientific investigations resulted in numerous deeper and much more solid insights than those available from creation myths. Think, for example, at health information of relevance for our life activities, including the relevance of so-called micronutrients in our regular nutrition. For example, embryonic human development requires the presence of vitamin A. This is a micronutrient. Its absence in the bodies of people living in some developing countries, eating mainly self-produced rice, can give rise to sick children. A successful application of genetic engineering has recently succeeded to introduce into the rice genome the genetic information for a precursor of vitamin A. This provides to rice grain a yellow color, and these are therefore called golden rice. One expects that daily ingestion of golden rice can prevent in pregnant women malformations of their baby. This example demonstrates that present, that present day biological research has the potential to update our daily food with relevant nutritional capacities. A still available high biodiversity on our planet can represent a relevant source for future developments in favor of our daily food provision. In the past recent centuries, increasing scientific knowledge, in particular in the medical sciences, brought about an increasing life expectancy. Together with other kinds of developments that facilitate human life, this has a strong impact on steadily increasing numbers of human beings on our planet. At the same time, agricultural processes became in many countries fundamentally changed from manual work to widely machine-helped planting and harvesting of food mostly in large fields that often become also sprayed with herbicides and pesticides. This kind of treatment can contribute to a stepwise loss of relevant biodiversity upon the production of our plant food. Our sun can be expected to provide energy to our planet Earth for a few thousand million years. But we cannot precisely predict how long life, and in particular human life, can be ensured to our civilization. Already in the recent past, and more so in future time periods, our existence on our planet is of global relevance and interdependence. In view of relevant conclusions, the human population cannot continue to grow. Rather, 
we must manage to find a more or less steady equilibrium in our human population density. This and other arguments render it difficult to reach appropriate conditions and global solutions in view of our future cultural development. Thank you for uh, kicking us off uh, um, with a perspective for the long term, from the long term and into the long term future, and um, giving us uh, already key examples on how science can influence um, human betterment. I would like to call now on Francis Arnold, the academician of the Pontifical Academy, professor of chemical engineering, bioengineering, and biochemistry, Nobel laureate in chemistry from uh, 2018. Uh, Francis, you will speak about replacing toxic pesticides, the natural approach. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much colleagues in the Pontifical Academy and participants in this workshop. Uh, I'd like to share my screen. I believe it's being shared now, I hope. Um, I'm here, it, 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 it's a real honor to be here and share a, a small example of how science can help farmers provide food safely and sustainably. Uh, and I'll take a few minutes to tell you about an innovation that comes from my field of research, chemistry, and specifically chemistry of the biological world to enable us to use fewer toxic insecticides to protect crops. And I have time only to give you one example, protecting maize crops against the fall armyworm. But our projects extend across several pests that are damaging and reducing yields of major row crops all over the world. Now, the caterpillar of Spadoptera frugipareta moth has been destroying crops all over the Americas for years. Commonly called the fall armyworm, this pest is highly destructive, especially of maize, which as you well know, is a staple food for many. Both the genetically modified traits of end insecticides have been used widely to combat this insect pest and often that use has been without careful planning and control. And as a result, resistance to insecticides and loss in the effectiveness of the GMO traits has been growing. Unfortunately, this just leads to more insecticide use and even faster development of resistance. And now- Do you mean to move your PowerPoint? Um, we are oh, still on the first slide. Oh, that's interesting. So, um, um, it's it's moving on my screen. Okay, it's, it's not moving for us. Uh, that's unfortunate. Well, you have to, uh, you know, off first and then turn on again. I'm going to stop the sharing and try it again. Right. Yes. All right, let me go back. Excellent. Yes, it works. Okay, so um, the, the fall fall armyworm can devastate crops. But the devastation caused by dramatic increased use of pesticides is equally frightening because this leads to biodiversity loss. And particularly concerning are the beneficial insects, but many other species are harmed as well. And of course, there are significant negative health impacts on the farmers and the consumers of the food. Now, the fall army word spread from the Americas to Africa in 2016 causing widespread destruction of crops of small farmers. In Kenya, for example, it led to 30% loss of the maize crop or a million tons. Because these farmers do not use the GMOs, their only resort is to spray insecticides if they can afford that. And again, with the loss of the biodiversity and health impacts. As often, even the most basic precautions are not taken when applying the, the insecticides. The pest and concomitant crop losses has continued to move inexorably east and even established in China in 2019 and unfortunately in Australia as well in 2020. So here's where the chemistry comes in. 
and it's not a new insecticide. Let me tell you about sex pheromones. These are the complex signaling molecules emitted by the female moth in order to attract her male mate. It is her Chanel number five, so to speak, that the male moth can sense up to a kilometer away. And so if you synthesize a sex pheromone chemically and spray it lightly in a field, you can confuse male insects. Suddenly she's everywhere and he can no longer find her. And this, this approach to crop protection is known as mating disruption. There's no toxic chemicals, nothing is killed. It's just that the insects no longer mate exactly where the pheromone cloud is. These are very specific to the species that's being targeted. And thus mating disruption is also highly selective and it does not interfere with other living things. And this brilliant mechanism has been used for more than 30 years to protect very high value crops from wine to almonds, stone fruits with no indication of resistance developing. Beneficial insects are preserved and the crops are not damaged. Now here's where chemistry comes in because the problem is that synthesizing these very complex molecules is extremely expensive. And that's why it's only been used in extremely high value crops. And no one ever tried to use this approach against the fall armyworm to protect row crops for poor people in Africa, for example. So new science comes in. A young Brazilian born chemist from my laboratory at Caltech decided he was going to solve this problem. And we started a lab in Santa Monica seven years ago where we developed whole new chemical and biological ways to produce the fall army worm pheromone and, and, and other pheromones. So there are a number of insects that you could go after with this mechanism. And we had to build the teams needed to produce and test these in field trials figuring out how to deliver pheromones that not just make them, right, but how do you deliver them efficiently? How do you obtain regulatory approval? And how do you provide them to farmers? And our, our simple solution is to package the pheromones, which are uh, made through new chemical and biological processes. We package them in small sachets that release the pheromones slowly over the growing period. We tested and optimized this product for several years in the United States in fields in Argentina, Brazil, and Mexico, all of where uh, the fall armyworm is, has very strong presence. presence. And we found that uh, very significant drops in the, um, in the damage caused by the fall armyworm and improvements in the quality of the crops, as well as reduced need for any insecticide sprays. Our success in Mexico, where maize is a staple diet of much of the population and GMO varieties are not used for human consumption has been very heartening. And these particular farmers are very happy with the results because they see production of themselves and the environments and their families as paramount for sustainability of their livelihoods. In fact, the very last trip that I took before the pandemic uh, cause shutdown of uh, travel was to meet with these farmers in Mexico and hear their stories firsthand. And I'm very pleased to say this is this product is now commercially available and has passed regulatory approval for use in maize in Mexico. Now their work growing fruit is not shut down <laughs> and we see this regulatory approval. And just by word of mouth, our entire Mexico production was sold out within days. And we're now making metric tons of these authentic insect pheromones. But let me tell you a little bit about Kenya. Our commitment has been to make this technology available to small holder, small holder farmers uh, throughout the world. And those are the ones to most benefit from a technology because they won't be using the insecticides. With a recent investment from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, we're making this happen. And a great example is Kenya, where trials have been ongoing for several years. Small horde of farmers produce 80% of the food in Africa, 60 to 70% of the maize in Kenya. And they're having trouble protecting their crops because this fall armyworm has now 
uh, been causing widespread destruction. So they use lots and lots of insecticides if they can afford it. And I have a short video I want to share with you of the words of the farmers themselves, uh, their own testimonials. I am very happy. Our maize done good. This year I got 42 bags and last year I got 32 bags. This time we sprayed only once. The other times we sprayed three times or two times. So I saved money and uh, I got 10 bags more. so this is just, these are the real farmers who've been using the product and we hope to get regulatory approval in Kenya shortly. And I just wanted to give this as an example of how advances in chemistry can improve the lives of, of poor farmers throughout the world. We're working in Indonesia, China, uh, Brazil, Mexico, and, and other places to bring these uh, technologies to small farmers and big farmers. And, and this is just one of many technologies that can be combined in what we call integrated pest management, uh, where we use nat natural mechanisms to decrease need for these external insecticides and make things much more targeted so that you can use many fewer inputs for agriculture. And with that, I'll just uh, thank you for having me and thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you so much, Francis. Uh, I have seen uh, not only the, the worm in the field in Ethiopia, Kenya, Uganda, but I've seen what human suffering it causes um, uh, in, the, uh, in the general food shortage situation. So um, this uh, appears to be very promising. Colleagues, uh, we now have um, a set of five minutes each presentations on global and regional perspectives um, on uh, uh, opportunities and challenges of science. First comes uh, uh, Volker Termoll, president of the Interacademy Partnership on global perspective, uh, a global perspective. Uh, Volker's field is medical science, but he is really a, um, um, a leader in the global world of academies of science. Uh, Volker, you have the floor. You need to unmute. But I have the screen, Joachim. Yes, um, you have it. I would like to show some slides. Yes, go ahead. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> dear colleagues, as you know, IAP, the Inter-Academy Partnership, represents all national academies of science, medicine, and engineering worldwide. And through IAP, their voices are not only heard at home on a national level, but also regionally and globally. A major a major strategic priority of IAP is to give science-based advice to policymakers and society. One of our recent global reports in this context was in food and nutrition security and agriculture. And in 2018, we published four regional reports compiled by the academies of Africa, Asia, Europe, and the Americas, and one global report on the scientific opportunity and challenges of the issue of food and nutrition security and agriculture. Our observation and findings were then presented at the S20 meeting in Argentina. Joachim von Braun now asked IAP whether we could provide an update of these five reports, in particular of the analysis and conclusion for an input 
to the upcoming UN food system. And I'm very grateful to the colleagues who carried out this task. These briefs are drawing on new evidence from the four global regions mentioned earlier, and they document the rapid pace of science and technology and innovation in the sector. They emphasize the need to act urgently worldwide if we want to secure the availability of food and nutrition over coming decades. Some examples will be presented by the presentations following my comments. Our updates reveal that there are opportunities from science to ensure access to safe and nutritional food for all, shift to sustainable consumption patterns, boost nature positive production, advance equitable livelihood, and build resilience to vulnerability, shocks, and stress. The policies brief show that there is a need for an increased commitment to invest in fundamental science, to connect the results to application, and to align with development priorities, and to improve collaboration and coordination worldwide and build partnerships between public and private sectors. But the updates also illustrate controversies such as the definition of healthy diets, the translation of research outputs to innovations, the use of new plant breeding techniques, and how best to build on good practice in farming patterns. Sorry. <clears throat> no, no, no. Uh, okay, the next one is next one. So there we are. From the science point of view, we need a transdisciplinary integration of priorities at the science policy interface and across all relevant sectors, including agriculture, environment, and health, because the food system has changed and keeps changing and has become very complex, thus demanding science based advice within the food system. Trade is an important factor. It has grave consequences, and the transnational global connections for food systems are very complex. IEP therefore suggests an international scientific advisory panel on the issue because of the currently fragmented advisory mechanism worldwide and to link robust research to policy development for governments. We, as IEP, would certainly support the establishment of such a panel, and I hope that at the meeting you're ha having <coughs> at the UN level will succeed in this endeavor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Volker. Uh, uh, that's an extremely important uh, policy proposition which you put before us. Um, I'm sure we will reflect on that in our outcome statements. Um, our next speaker uh, on the list is uh, Usman Badiane. I did not see Usman connected so far from, uh, he's currently in Washington. Um, if I'm not mistaken, he has not connected. Then I move on to uh, Morakot Tanchi Sharon, a member of the scientific group um, from Thailand. Uh, she is in the field of microbiology and biotechnology, a senior advisor to the president of the National Science and Technology Development Agency. Um, Maura Kurt, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Asia is a vast area with vastly different regions and country when it comes to food production and security issue. To address the important questions and problems related to the bioeconomy, I need to fall back on the experience of Thailand, which is an experience really when too many country in Asia. In Asia, our problem is either one of not enough nutritional food or one of an overweight population, obesity. Some of our country are major food exporter, while others do not have enough. One of the em emerging opportunity for science and technology intervention in Asia is the introduction of the bioeconomy, particularly circular agriculture. This is defined as being a closed loop economic system in which resources are continually used to maximize their weighing, reduce, reuse, and recycle 
screen principle. And enabling effectively, this include good water management, recycling agricultural waste, and not relying on a single commodity. Key is the restoration of soil nutrition. This system also dovetailed deeply with the feed yourself first principle now being more widely adopted. Already some promising case study are emerging in Southeast Asia, giving confidence that this is, this is the correct path to follow. I give you uh, one example, the innovation at the, at the local level. This is the village in the Northern part of Thailand. When we start the project, they have two serious problems. It's a depth and water. So with the help from a private sector, they build a you know, small dam to catch the water. Right now they are self-sufficient in rice production and it's an organic rice. They don't use the pesticides at all. And more than that, they have to bring their paddy to, you know, to the town, to the commercial rice mill, uh, rice, uh, rice milling, uh, and then pay a lot for traveling costs and also you know, like costs for milling as well. So we developed the, you know, the, the community rice milling machine and then adjust you know, to, to suit with the uh, you know, like community. And now they are working on that. And then also they have a rice brand, they have a, you know, like white rice, which have a higher value. And more than that, they don't burn the rice straw. So they use the rice straw you know, to make a biodegradable rice straw paper. So they have a small factory over, you know, inside the village. So this is an example. You can read more, you know, from a 85 track paper on building resilience and vulnerability, you know, to shock and stress written by Tom Hertel, uh, Ismahan and Frank Ebert. In order to promote green policy that are based on value creation, innovation and ecological harmony, the ASEAN Bioeconomy Bio Network has been established the network plays an important role in the ASEAN Innovation Roadmap and Bioeconomy Forum. Already, there is evidence of a greater willingness to share knowledge on food production within the region, despite the constraint imposed by COVID-19. Concurrent with developing a bioeconomy in Thailand is the wisdom left behind by our late uh, King Rama the Nai, King Pumipon, who was active in promote, promoting farmer self-sufficiency. The idea that farmers should first grow a wide diversity of crops and animals for their own needs, be less reliant on monocrops and only sell any excess that they might be produced. His new theory for land use in agriculture is to divide land into four different zones, water, reservoir, and aquaculture, fruit and vegetable, rice field, housing and garden with small animal. The beauty of this form of farming is the direct benefit of a good diet to the farmer and his or her family, because usually they grow only rice. They eat more rice, but less vegetable and fruit. So this one, they can balance, you know, they can shift to healthy diet. It has the added benefit of the farmer not being devastated should one of the crop fail. And ideally, this leads to debt-free farming. The promising trend is that of putting the farmer first through social well-being. Hopefully, this trend will be adopted by other agricultural community in the region. The key to success of this example is to improve the interface between policymaker and scientists, and between scientists and farmers. Sai has much to offer, but we need to create an environment where researchers are interacting directly with farmers in the field. However, we have to educate the researcher with the belief that their work can be of direct benefit and we need to show the satisfaction that can be had by going off cam campus while still maintaining academic credit. Scientists also have much to learn from farmers but need to be records in collecting data and publishing their finding, even as case study. This is bottom-up analysis. We need more example of our success story in this field to convince the policymaker that this is a legitimate and beneficial role for scientists. One of the greatest challenges facing food production in Asia is climate change. 
more unpredictable while island weather has seen higher crop loss, warming ocean are happening change to aquaculture and harvesting of the sea. However, out of these are emerging some promising development with some crops such as cassava, showing adaptability to changing climate. Grape variety adapted to the tropical climate in Thailand and India are attracting much interest in a warming Europe. Much more research collaboration on this is needed worldwide, particularly at the biological level. I hope this presentation provides a quick snapshot of development in the Asian region and the direction for science we are pursuing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maura Kart, and um, thank you also for bringing in the whole issue of water um, and uh, connecting science to the local level. Next is Elizabeth Hudson uh, de Jaramillo, member of scientific group, professor emeritus at the School of Science of the Pontificia Universidad Javeriana in Colombia. Her field is botany and bioscience, and she is a co-author of the IAP study on uh, Latin America and the Caribbean. There's the floor, Elizabeth. Thank you very much. Good afternoon and good morning for the Americas. Uh, I'll talk uh, about the regional perspective uh, for Latin America and the Caribbean. The transformation of food systems in the Americas is crucial in su for sustainability in all its dimensions, social, environmental, and economic, because the Americas is the world's largest net food producer and exporter. Let's see a bit the context. The Latin America and the Caribbean region has an exceptional abundance of natural resources and is a great world reserve of arable land and forests. It makes vital contributions to several development objectives, including growth and trade promotion, employment and poverty reduction, food and nutrition security, ecosystem services, and climate resilience. The region, as I said, is a major supplier of grains and oil seeds, as well as fruits and vegetables, coffee and sugar, among many other things. Therefore, agriculture is a very important sector for the economy of most of the countries. Although there is a substantial diversity in resources, and also in science and technology capacities among the countries. Large differences exist among across the subregion, but we have very important scientific advances. The transformation of food systems in Latin America and the Caribbean requires a comprehensive, participatory, inclusive approaches, aiming at making full use of current and future scientific advances, such as biotechnologies and digital technologies, which are already transforming global agriculture, looking forward to produce more with less, increasing efficiency and reducing residues with the bioeconomy model. We need to change to healthy and sustainable consumption patterns and promote the use of residues. The integration of science and technology developments and investment opportunities to national and regional policy making is essential, as well as communicating its potential to the public. The policies must respond to local conditions, capacities, and cultures, and consider the vulnerable groups, but also they must be coordinated with global trends. The need is to develop efficient national and regional innovation ecosystems with technical cooperation, national and international one. The needed innovative transition in integrated value chains requires new approaches for the relationship between scientific research and local knowledge systems. We must integrate really them. And as said before, Bottom-up and territorial processes are needed because the communities are the ones to decide what is the real important thing for them. 
very specific science and technology-based opportunities for Latin America and the Caribbean include three different actions. The first one is to use the great agrobiodiversity of Latin America and the Caribbean to diversify food systems, including nutritious, underutilized, or neglected indigenous crops, which are adapted also to difficult conditions, thereby increasing nutritional content and climate change resilience, as well as new bioproducts. The use of biotechnological developments for plant selection and breeding for product transformation to add value and for residue transformation. Uh, the second one is to enable and promote the use of digital technologies in the food value chain to increase efficiency and in the inputs use. The third one is that additional to biodiversity conservation is to maintain soil and water systems health. We need water and soils. Uh, we need to use uh, beneficial soil microorganisms to improve studies in the microbiomes for sustainable increases in productivity. With these three things, we could improve a lot and we can change food systems. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elizabeth. And thank you for drawing the attention to, to soils on which we depend so much with future productivity. Next and last in this session um, is uh, Robin Fias, Director, Bioscience Program for European Academies, um, Science Advisory Council, the e EASAC, uh, the European paper contributed, co-authored uh, by him. Robin, you have the floor. Thank you, Joachim. I would like to share my screen to show a couple of slides, if I may. Ah, uh, let's, okay. Okay, um, I, as uh, instruction said, I'm speaking on behalf of uh, academies in Europe. Um, and I'll move rapidly on to my next slide. Um, as a generalization, food system science is, is relatively strong in Europe, but it's certainly the case that Europeans are not immune from public health problems associated with food and nutrition insecurity, whether that's undernutrition or, or obesity. Moreover, although Europe has diverse farming systems, uh, it's notable that we import a high proportion of our food, and this means that European decisions have consequences for the rest of the world. For example, Europe is exporting the consequences of its lack of agricultural sustainability, partly as a result of consumer food choices and partly as a result of policy regulatory actions. There's increasing interest in Europe, in the European Union, in transformational change for food systems. Uh, for example, we, currently we have a farm to fork policy under development by our European Commission uh, and the scientific community is, is supporting that with, with our uh, advice to ensure that it's evidence-based. But in this particular case, the farm to fork policy um, although it has very ambitious objectives for sustainability and food security, policymakers must be careful not to repeat previous mistakes in, in focusing on short-term objectives and political issues for their member states at the expense of neglecting consequences for everybody else in the longer term. That, that's one controversy. Uh, I've turned to a couple of other controversies in the context of scientific opportunities. Um, and I think these have global relevance, although there is a particular European dimension, both. First, the impact of COVID-19. Well, we've had a big impact on health in Europe and there have been negative impacts on agriculture and food systems more generally through, through interruption of labour for harvesting, interruption of supply chains, uh, weakening access by vulnerable groups. Nonetheless, that there are scientific opportunities that can help to redress these problems, prepare for the next pandemic, and uh, create a better society following the current pandemic. Scientific opportunities range from um, advances in food processing to increase food safety and shelf life. Um, 
new types of food to protect immune function uh, and maybe help to defend against COVID-19, smarter logistics uh, to help in, in the case of disrupted supply lanes, lines, and particularly using social sciences to provide the evidence base for new social protection mechanisms for the vulnerable groups. Uh, and we want to emphasize very much that social sciences is a core part of the transdisciplinary approaches we have to bring to food system science. But there are controversies in thinking about COVID-19. Many of our countries are, are now planning how to create sustainable economic recoveries after the pandemic, variously called green recoveries and, and so on. Um, and, and while some of our European governments have committed to this, it's important to monitor that they will deliver uh, that those commitments based on the scientific evidence base with objectives for health, environment and, and equity, as well as for the economic recovery. The, the, the other controversy, which we touched on a couple of times previously, is, is how do we respond to climate change? So science can show us a, a number of ways of uh, developing climate resilient agriculture, for example, using the scientific advances in genome editing, such as CRISPR-Cas9, um, to develop new plant varieties that may be resistant to drought or heat stress, or, or indeed pests and diseases. Um, we, we have the science to do this, as, as many of you, of course, know. Um, unfortunately, in Europe, we still have a relatively inflexible regulatory system um, that creates a significant deterrent to innovation, um, in, particularly in terms of uh, the history of GMOs, but that also now in terms of application of genomics. Um, we're still trying to work through this controversy in, in Europe. Uh, it has been difficult to uh, de develop an evidence-based regulatory framework. Um, and the general point here is that the scientific push to innovation it is not enough. We also need evidence-based regulatory frameworks to encourage our innovation. My, my final slide, um, I, I finish just by summarizing um, the, the goal for us all to, to use scientific outputs to connect with multiple policy areas. It's not just agriculture. Agriculture links to another a number of other sectors in environment, bioeconomy, uh, uh, and so on, as, as some of you have said, this requires transdisciplinary science. It also requires a, a joined up policy world across different sectors and, and at the local, regional and, and global levels. But we've been talking in the last few minutes about the regional perspectives. This is very important time for I I ensuring all that we can all align um, for our objectives, the food systems transformation with other global discussions, whether that's in terms of the SDGs or the Paris Agreement goals of forthcoming COP26 to be held in, in Europe, uh, and other conceptual initiatives for the biodiversity, the bioeconomy, and the circular economy. I think it's fair, fair to say, and I'll close with saying that European scientists are very keen to help play this international role. Uh, we, we've seen a, a recent example from our European Commission in, in leading on an assessment for the need for an international platform for food system science that, that will um, roll out over the next few months, which may not be aligned very well in its timetable with the uh, UN Food System Summit. But I think it's very relevant to some of the things we're talking about with regard to global coordination in our science base and, and advice um, to those who are using the outputs in science. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Robin. Uh, colleagues, uh, this was uh, a fast moving session. Uh, it was uh, not moving fast enough to protect discussion time, uh, but we had some very interesting presentations and insights, um, which we will reflect on in the, uh, as we work through the agenda. We now have, uh, uh, in our next session, three most distinguished speakers, um, uh, which will be introduced in a moment by the chair of this session, which is uh, Professor Mohammed Hassan. Let me introduce uh, Mohammed. He is a mathematician, vice chair of the scientific group and member of the Pontifical Academy of Science, 
He's president of the Sudanese National Academy of Science, and he actually was a, a former uh, president of the so-called Third World Academy. Um, I just uh, welcome our three distinguished speakers and hand over to you, Mohammed. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Joachim, uh, for the introduction. And it is indeed my uh, pleasure to welcome you all to the second session of this workshop. The title of the session is Science and Action for the Food Systems Summit and Implications for a Conducive Science Society Policy Interface. We have three very prominent keynote speakers in this one hour session. And each of the three speakers will give a presentation of uh, 10 minutes. Uh, after the presentations, uh, we shall have 30 minutes of discussion uh, with the participants. And finally, conclusions of today's session by uh, Joachim von Braun. It is now my pleasure to request our first keynote speaker, uh, Archbishop Paul Galaga, the Secretary for relations with the states within the Holy See Secretariat of the State. Uh, Archbishop, uh, you are invited to give your talk. Excellencies, distinguished academicians, ladies and gentlemen. I should point out that uh, I, I'm not a, a scientist, so therefore my view is tends to be Political. I might have been a scientist if I hadn't become a priest, but that's, 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 that's another story. At the outset, I wish to thank Professor Joachim von Braun for the kind invitation to offer some remarks at this workshop organized by the scientific group of the UN Food Systems Summit in cooperation with the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. In September 2018, at the opening of the technical workshop, on food safety and healthy diets organized by the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. I underline that according to official estimates, the number of people worldwide suffering from chronic hunger was slightly lower than the figure registered in 2010 to 2012 and showed a decrease of 70% compared with 1990 to 1992. Since then, the world population has almost doubled. These data I mentioned tell us that something has changed for the better. Nevertheless, it is not enough. In 2020, after only one and a half years, we had sadly to recognize that the number of people affected by hunger was increasing once again. Furthermore, it is and will be strongly exacerbated by the pandemic which has direct and indirect impacts on production, distribution, and access to food, the availability of which has been compromised both in the short and long term, especially for the most vulnerable. The specter of famine is crossing our world once more. The causes are many. You know them better than me. They partly depend on an uneven distribution of the Earth's goods, on a lack of investment in the agricultural sector, on food losses and waste, as well as on the proliferation of conflicts in different areas of the planet. Making matters worse, there is climate change, which especially affects the small rural producers who live in countries more likely to be exposed to natural disasters and whose economy is based on the agricultural sector. The fight against hunger appears to have stalled and the pandemic made even clearer the vulnerabilities and inadequacies of global food systems. The current circumstances clearly show that the food goods of health, environment, climate and security, which affect and are affected by food systems are not just individual or national goods, but public goods. They require an integral and collective approach, both at a substantive and geographical level. Internationally, this approach takes the name of multilateralism, 
through constructive and interdisciplinary dialogue. For these reasons, the convening of the UN Food Systems Summit is quite timely. We need urgently to understand how to transform food systems so that they may become catalysts of the implementation of the 2030 Agenda, increasing resilience in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, strengthening local economies, improving nutrition, educating producers on the reuse and recycling of resources so that food waste may be reduced, supplying healthy diets accessible to all and being environmentally sustainable and respectful of local culture. In this process of food systems transformation, I would like to underline very briefly some issues which in the opinion of the Holy See should inspire our efforts. First, the respect of human dignity. Concrete measures to end hunger and malnutrition, which are the main aims of food systems, must always respect human dignity and the recognition of the right of every person to be free from poverty, hunger and malnutrition. Food security is linked not with the demographic aspect of quantity of people, but with quality features such as unfair access and distribution of safe food, improper information or lack of care to those in vulnerable situations. This entails the duty of the entire human family to act in order to provide practical and effective assistance to those most in need. Second, the centrality of food systems. It is important for the international community to understand the central role of, of the agricultural sector within the economic and political decision-making process taken by policymakers in order to achieve a stable, safe, and shared well-being based on an accessible food security and food safety for all. The agricultural sector is known as the primary economic sector, but since many decades, it has been considered the least wheel on the economic wagon. The last wheel on the economic wagon, sorry. It is now time to restore dignity to this sector and rediscover the primacy of agricultural development from which depend the fulfillment of many basic needs, just as from vegetables, which are at the base of the tro trophic pyramid, depend the correct functioning of, this, of the, this latter. Third, food systems as a potential tool of conflict resolution. We can mention many conflicts around the food systems, such as those over resources. Just think of the conflicts on water and land, or between the main players of the food system as industrial and private sector, civil society, local population, indigenous people, resource institutions, or in the interaction between science, economics, and ethics. These means sparing no, this means sparing no effort to promote dialogue and a change of mindset. Perspective at the basis of the food system's transformational effort which the fundamental aim aims to prevent conflicts and to overcome inequalities, even between man and woman. We have many examples of achieving these aims and we should work to share and disseminate good practices and learning and drawing lessons which can be replicated in other places. Fourth, since farmers play a key role in making food systems sustainable, small farmers and agricultural families should be considered as privileged actors in our food systems transformation process. They should not be considered as invisible in this process. Small farmers' traditional knowledge, even in a better understanding of what is known as agroecology, cannot be neglected or disregarded. Real priorities and needs are better understood through their direct involvement. Favoring small farmers' access to the services needed for the, for the production, marketing and use of agricultural resources is now compulsory. The communities concerned should also be able directly to manage the necessary means and assume their own level of responsibility and consequent action. The answer therefore is enhancing the small farmers capacity building as well as promoting strategy based on small investments 
and family farming through tools such as microcredit. Small scale agriculture could thus be encouraged as a guarantee for a healthy diet, going beyond just considering the role of large companies or extensive production. Fifth, education. When we take into account the education perspective as a founding aspect of the food system's transformation process, we, sh we should underlie the values at the base of this perspective. This would require, of course, lo a long reflection. In the short time, I will limit myself only to anchoring the food system's education process to the needed transition leading us from the currently prevailing culture of waste to the culture of care. This transition requires an interdisciplinary dialogue. Science and innovative technology are needed to feed people and to improve food systems, but they are not sufficient to achieve important goals such as the ones contained in SDG2. Life is bigger than science. The study of the laws of nature and wide ranging scientific investigations can widely benefit from an in-depth and interdisciplinary dialogue with human sciences, aimed at building the, eth the ethical framework within which to build the responsibility of each of us with our different skills to respond to the mandate of caring and cultivating the creation. On the basis of these five assets, the Holy See is planning to give its contribution to the journey towards the UN Food System Summit. It will do it through the exchange of experiences with high level experts on different issues, such as among others, the role of rural women in the food systems transformation, the role of decent work, finance and innovation in helping to ensure a just and sustainable food system, the way to respond to current conflicts in food systems. Food systems can indeed be an important player by in implementing a new development paradigm based on the integral ecology approach promoted by Pope Francis. The UN summit represents a unique opportunity to build a just and resilient world in which no one is left behind and to leave a better world for future generations. It has significant momentum to intensify international action towards strengthening food systems and combating food insecurity and malnutrition in a strongly global context exacerbated by the impact of the pandemic and climate change. It can represent an important vehicle for dialogue and progress in the development of more sustainable food systems and the achievement of the sustainable development goals. It should not represent a point of arrival, but the point of a long-term process which needs a follow-up and a review system in charge of guiding new actions and results and which will allow sharing experiences, lessons and knowledge. In this perspective, the scientific group for the UN Food Systems Summit plays now and hopefully will play in the future a central role. This is not an easy task. Pope Francis has repeatedly supported the importance of an approach centered on food systems sustainable and able to offer healthy diets accessible to all. Blaming the fact on the 21st century, hunger is not only a tragedy for humanity, but also a shame. Thank you for your kind attention. Mohammed, you need to unmute. Thank you very much, uh, Archbishop. And many thanks for raising these very important and critical issues of poverty, of hunger, of inequalities, and uh, the role of uh, education, the role of science and technology in uh, alleviating these problems. These are very critical issues that we are going to deal with in our scientific group. And we are very much in line with your thinking. I'm very happy about this presentation. Now, our uh, second keynote speaker is the FAO Director General, uh, Dr. Uh, Chu Dongyu. Uh, Director General, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Vice President. And uh, Professor Van Braun, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, science and innovation 
uh, very deeply rooted in my heart. So as a scientist for more than 35 years, and also a strong advocate of innovative approaches, I'm very pleased to be here today. We are at a critical moment in time. The world is not on track to achieve the zero hunger by 2030. Our agri-food systems are not performing optimally. And also the pandemic has prompted all of us to rethink the way we produce, process, and consume food. To achieve the SDGs by 2030, we needed to adopt a holistic, coordinated approaches, harnessing science, technology, and innovation to transform our agri-food systems. Strengthening the science policy interface is critical. Scientific evidence needed to inform decision makers and catalyze this transformation. Today's challenges remind us more than ever that we must work together, solidarity, agency, accountability, and action are needed to achieve the ambitious transformative change required we needed to change the policy, mindset, behaviors, and business models. Here at FAO, unprecedented transformative action took place in the past 20 months. We adjusted the organizational structure, broke down silos, and introduced a deep reform for an efficient, effective, and agile FAO to better serve our members. We have 194 members, so include all uh, people eh, who are, of course, to pay attention to the food and the culture. Our flagship Hand in Hand initiative aims to accelerate agricultural transformation and the sustainable rural development based on data and information, especially for the poorest countries. It is supported by the Hand in Hand Geospatial Platform and Data Lab for Statistical Innovation, which combines big data and artificial intelligence for decision making. FAO's Green Cities and 1,000 Digital Value Initiatives are also opportunity for innovation and transformation of agri-food systems. FAO Chief Scientist, the first in the, F in the organization history, works to ensure our strong science-based voice across all our workers in FO systems. The Office of Innovation was established to further reinforce and expand innovation and technology as a key component of our activities. But it is very important to think of innovation more holistically. It is not just about the new technology. It is also about the financial, networking, and the new business models. To reach impact at scale, new and transformative partnerships are needed, including with the private sector, academia, civil society, and so on. Our new strategy for private sector engagement drives proactive cooperation for benefit our members. And we must elaborate new and enabling policy basis based on the best available evidence, policies that foster the production of nutritious food and make them safe, affordable, and accessible. Efforts in new centers are further advancing the organization knowledge basis to inform action and act as a supportive hubs for the science policy dialogue. The Joint FAO WHO Center integrated FAO's work on food safety, animal disease, and antimicrobial resistant AMR through a one health approach. And the Joint Center between FAO and the IAEA on nuclear techniques in food and agriculture. FAO New Strategy Framework seeks to support the 2030 agenda through the transformation to more efficient, more inclusive, more resilient, and more sustainable agri-food systems for better production, better nutrition, a better environment, a better life, leaving no one behind. 
to accelerate progress and realize our aspiration if we will apply four cross-cutting accelerators in all our programmatic interventions. That are technology, innovation, data, and the complements, which are the governance, human capital, and the institutions. Dear colleagues, the UN Food Summit provide an excellent opportunity to work together to ensure that our agri-food systems are more efficient, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable, and can provide a healthy diet for all. FAO is the UN anchor organization of Track One, Action Track One, ensure safe and nutritious food for all, and is engaged in all of the other tracks, drawing on our extensive technical knowledge. We are the part of our scientific group that is ensure the robustness and breadth and also independence of the science that it underpins the summit and its outcomes. The scientific group lead UN First Summit 2021 Science Days will be facilitated and co-hosted by FAO on 8 and 9 July this year. We'll focus on the highlighting the centrality of science, technology, and innovation for agro-food system transformation. Science can play the pivotal role in identifying synergies and trade-offs across the different dimensions of agro-food systems and advances evidence-based policy making. This science days, as well as our workshop today, allow us to take stock of the science and evidence base engage in the dialogue, share the experience around the science-based actions and the solutions. Ladies and gentlemen, as a scientist and knowledge-based organization, we needed to be vocal and we needed to support the agro-food system transformation using science and innovation. FAO will continue to provide full support to the UN for the system summit, the preparatory process and beyond. So let's work together, learning together, and contribute together. In that, we can really speed up, scale up the application of science and innovation and the benefit to the people, especially the vulnerable ones, which we have to pay more attention to. Uh, thank you. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director uh, General. Thank you for emphasizing the importance of innovation and uh, science and technology. And uh, I think it's very interesting to learn that you are working closely also with the private sector. That is something that is also very important for us in the scientific group. Uh, but um, I also liked uh, working together with WHO and FAO, uh, uh, joint FAO, WHO, and the International Atomic Energy Agency in establishing uh, centers, centers of excellence on specific issues. I think these are all very important issues that you have highlighted. Thank you for doing that. And uh, our third uh, uh, speaker, uh, keynote. Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, I have the pleasure to introduce an additional panel member who has joined us, uh, Cardinal Torxon, who is uh, the President of the Council for Justice and Peace, and who happens to be a champion of the Food Systems Summit has joined us. And I would like to ask you, Chair, to give him the floor after we have listened to um, Agnes Halibata. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Okay, so our third uh, keynote speaker uh, is the UN Special Envoy for uh, the Food Systems Summit. Dr. Angus Kalibata. I'm sure that many of you have heard I speaking in different occasions, but um, Angus, it is my pleasure to request you to give your presentation. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed. And let me start by acknowledging uh, your grace, Archbishop Gary. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Let me also thank you, um, Professor Joachim and the scientific group and the Academy, the Pontific Academy of Science for organizing this workshop that gives us an opportunity <clears throat> to have a conversation around the work that you all have been doing. 
As the special envoy, I'm extremely grateful to the work of the scientific group, to the time you've taken and the effort you're putting into ensuring that this summit, the Food System Summit, has a base in science and really leaves uh, no doubts in people's minds as it comes uh, to fruition. So thank you so much for the support that you're all giving us. Today, I chose to talk about the role of science and innovation uh, and, uh, in, in ending hunger. And I called my presentation, the nexus between science, police and innovation. It's, uh, I, uh, Dr. Chu talked about it. Uh, it's really uh, so many years after launching the, the, the SDGs that it's very surprising that we are not only behind, but we are actually increasing hunger. So for me, it's a question that is very dear to my heart. I work in an environment where dealing with hunger is very critical to the work that we do here on the African continent. But science has been at the, at the uh, really uh, has been the base of us delivering against hunger, whether it's what we've done, and you all know about it in the last 50 to 75 years, we now produce over 300 more food than we did. Or whether it's when a country like India produces five times more food because of the work they've, been, they've done in embracing science and the green revolution. I just want to underscore that these gains and leaps and bounds were not possible or would not have been possible if uh, policymakers and the politicians did not embrace the work of science. And that's when Swaminathan met his prime minister and they discussed the value of improved seed in improving farmers' lives then things needed, started changing. Or when Meles Zanao invited Norman Bolog, and they started talking about the value of the science uh, in ending the hunger that was happening in Ethiopia, that things started happening. But also in my own country in Rwanda, where smallholder farmers, very small, the smallest in the world, 0.3 of a hectare, actually take charge of their lives and end hunger in their country. And here I'll tell you how we use science. Science was critical, of course, it all begins with the seed. Science was critical because we had those seeds, improved seeds to go with. But we also had evidence from scientists like you at IFPRI and maybe some of you that told us what direction to take, that weighed options and helped us figure out what we needed to do. But what it did, we, it also gave us, it gave our policymakers an opportunity to, to think through what they wanted to do and what type of investments they would, they would put in place. So it's really, really important that we understand the place we hold for, for this Food System Summit, which takes me now to your work as the group that is sitting at the nexus between the science and the evidence that the summit is looking for to be able to design ambitious action, but also to be able to come through on transitions in our food system. So yes, your work is going to be about ensuring that we come through on SDGs in an ambitious way because we are behind. We have 10 years and from a farmer's language, they will say we have nine seasons to go. So we have to come through in the time that is remaining, but it's also about the necessary transitions in our food system. And we have to call out what those transitions are going to be. So I need to highlight a few things that I would like us to keep in mind as we go towards the, the Food Systems Summit and the pre-summit in, in, uh, in July. This summit is about people. That's why I decided to call out hunger. This summit is about people. It's about ending hunger. It's about ending malnutrition and all nutritional related challenges. It's about health, but it's also about the future of our planet and what's happening to the planet today. So let's use this moment to really get our voices out there. The second point I would like to raise is that I would like to make sure that as scientists, you make this moment last. The moment where people understand and appreciate the role of science to inform, to inform policy and to inform investments. The, 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 UN, the, UN, the UN Secretary General picked the moment and decided that he would use you as scientists to help him defend that moment. We, we should make this last in people's mind, the value of science to drive uh, the work that is happening in our world. Let's put a lot of emphasis on reimagining our world. Reimagining helps people open up their minds to possibilities, 
to new ways of doing business. It's probably a better way of looking at some of the challenges we are facing than talking about trade-offs. When we talk about trade-offs, minds shut up, uh, opportunities close up. So maybe if we, we, we really come at it from a place where we are helping people reimagine, think about how they can reimagine their future and the future of our planet, I think we'll win a lot of souls and hearts. Let's remember that science has local relevance and let's, uh, in this designing solutions and helping people understand frameworks that we must use, let's anchor it in frameworks that will allow people in their local environments to come up with solutions that are critical to their problems. I want to conclude on a challenge on reimagining. The following report talks about how reimagining our food system is a $4.5 trillion opportunity for businesses and for institutional reimagining and new architecture of institutions. And the examples that may discuss, the examples for a country like China, we are reimagining the institutional arrangements and how to deliver using different uh, mechanisms of institutions has delivered a lot for them. And I've also seen it in my own work in Rwanda. I would like us, as we conclude, to think about how we have bold conversations. This summit has been about, you know, what should and what shouldn't be, what conversations we are having. As scientists, you have a responsibility to ensure that those conversations are true to people and are true to our world. And we look forward to you helping us ensure that we define the boldest ambition for how to deliver in the next nine seasons, but also we define the necessary transitions in our food system, irrespective of how uncomfortable that might sound. So thank you so much. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to be part of this conversation. And I look forward to the conversations you're having as we head to the pre-summit and summit later in the year. Thank you again, Mohammed. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Angus. And uh, thank you for again, uh, uh, highlighting the importance and, 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 and value of science um, uh, to guide policy. And, and also the role of uh, institutions, uh, strong institutions, uh, to deal with all these issues that we have been struggling with. Um, uh, you welcome. I think I lost you when you wanted uh, somebody else to speak now because uh, the line fell. Well, the panel has been enriched by Cardinal Turkson. Cardinal Turkson is uh, a former champion appointed by Agnes Kalibata of the Food Systems Summit. And we have the pleasure that he has joined us. I suggest uh, uh, Cardinal, uh, we take the Thank you. Thank you, Cardinal. Please go ahead. Welcome. <laughs> so, so uh, your, your Excellency, so all of you, I see my boss, Agnes, they're smiling. And we've not seen each other in a while, but. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be able to join you uh, via this medium uh, to share a, a few thoughts. I think the talk about the preparation for the food summit is actually preparation for food security and food safety. Both of them probably to go to, to in, uh, together hand in hand. And talking about that immediately uh, comes to mind an expression that Pope Francis used already in 2015 at the Milan Food Expo. He talked about the paradox of abundance. And uh, with that, he meant that there's so much food and yet so much waste. And so, so much, who, uh, so much, uh, so very many people go to bed still hungry. And so he goes on to say that while waste, excessive consumption, and the use of food for other purposes is visible before our eyes, several still go to bed hungry. This is the paradox, he said. The possibility then of ad admiring the richness and the beauty of the world uh, at summits brings over the full power. How is it possible that in a world that is able to obtain many results, the poor and the hungry still exist? How is it possible that we haven't yet eliminated poverty and hunger and malnutrition? Have we worked hard enough in this struggle? And then continues then to offer his suggestions. So for according in this, in this uh, sense then, the summit that we're preparing for can probably help put similar questions. 
And as Agnes has just suggested, we're looking not only at statistical figures, but look, looking at the faces of really hungry people. Well, Francis has suggested that how to proceed in view, uh, in view of this and to change mentality. We must keep before our eyes the faces of those millions of children, women and men who are suffering from hunger. It is those faces that are the true reality that is behind the representations of the world and above all behind and beyond the paradoxes. In these days then, uh, in these months, uh, the faces of the poor enter our homes through the terrible images and the drama of migrants, refugees, the victims of war and all. Many are fleeing from war, but many still cannot work in the environment on account of the effects of climate change and global warming. And so today, as the Holy Father suggested then, even more than ever, I'm convinced that the objectives and the policies of development must serve to combat poverty and not to eliminate the poor, to combat hunger and not to simply look at the phenomenon and the statistical figures. Ms. Agnes Kalibata has just talked about food security and science serving the production of food. I want to do the, I want to step one step beyond this and talk about the relationship between food production and finance. It is, the first is about the relationship between agriculture production and finance. The financial instruments, which today we call derivatives, were invented as a means to control the uncertainty tied to the oscillation of prices, reducing the precariousness of, produ of producers of food stuff. But when financial speculation makes, uh, takes over, the result is an increase in the volatility of prices and therefore a worsening of the conditions for producers and for farmers, especially the smallest ones. And so, as our own Dikasi has had a chance to observe, the small producers are particularly vulnerable to price volatility, which can influence their work negatively and sometimes also tragically causing loss of work and even leading them into bankruptcies. So derivatives are an example of what was originally an instrument to fight against poverty and the oscillations of food, food prices, but which in fact have become a weapon in the war against the poor and against the hungry. And that is something that we need to look at. The only uh, possible solution, according to Pope Francis, is to get out of the model of development imprisoned by, imprisoned by entanglements between technocracies and immediate results. On an account of this, pay attention also to the impact of climate on the environment and the terrain in which food is produced. It's been observed by again another Pope, of France, Pope uh, Benedict XVI, that our environment and the way we treat it directly impact on our lives. Food production, ecosystems, biodiversity, and the land, the terrain in which food, uh, food, uh, food is produced, these are interdependent variables. None of them can be considered in their isolation. And so as we had for this summit, the pre-summit, to discuss food production and all, we need to keep together all of these elements and see how we can address them together since they are not independently viable points of discussion. To see how we can address them both with view to ensuring food safety and not only food safety, but also food security. So I like, thank you, uh, Mohammed, for giving me this uh, uh, brief moment, almost kind of uh, on plan. But I thank you for having accommodated this, this brief intervention of mine. Thank you. But, but thank you so much. Your intervention was, was very timely and very appropriate. And I like this uh, paradox of abundances. I think this is an interesting notion um, as it relates to poverty, of course. Uh, but what is, 
what, what, is, what is really important is I think you and before you, the Archbishop also highlighted these problems of inequalities. I think it's very important to, for us to realize, uh, as many people have said before me some time ago, um, you cannot really have an island of wealth surrounded by oceans of poverty, food insecurity, and inequalities. You, it cannot, it cannot ex coexist like this. Something has to happen to you. So this is really the fundamental issue that underline uh, all the discussions that we have been having uh, since the beginning of uh, this uh, scientific group, addressing inequalities and especially inequalities, not only in food and, uh, and nutrition, but also uh, inequalities in issues that really relate or reinforce these inequalities, issues related to education, as the uh, Cardinal uh, and, and the Bishop said, issues related to education and issues related to the empowerment of women in the area of technology and science. So these are fundamental issues that are of great concern also to us in the scientific group. Uh, so with that, we finish the presentations and I think we do have some time, uh, maybe about 20 minutes, uh, for uh, discussions, uh, questions and answers. Uh, so I would like to open the floor now for any questions, any observations, any comments you might like to have. I, I have a very small screen here. So you're welcome if you can help me to identify people. Who wants to start? I, I They're have... all muted. Yes, please go ahead. I have a question for the people that are following the data. Probably the FAO people must have this data. How much the current yeah. pandemics has increased the problem of hunger in the world? In a sense that basically people producing less food, distribution is a problem. Do we have numbers on that? So who, uh, who would like to answer this? I, I can answer if, if it's possible. It is Maximo Torero. Yes, yes, sure. yes, how are you? Hi, how are you? Uh, yes, we have some numbers, of course, still are, are projections and, and we are coming with the latest numbers based on our latest surveys in a month from now when we release the SOFI. But in, in terms of undernourishment, chronic undernourishment, uh, the increase in, in chronic undernourishment because of COVID-19 is around one, up to 132 million more people going into chronic undernourishment, which is the SDG indicator, the POU measure that we have. Also, there has been deterioration in all the other indicators of, of, of nutrition. Uh, and in addition, we have the, the food insecurity experience scale, where we are observing uh, a significant increase in acute food insecurity, especially the region which is the mostly affected at this point is Latin America, and also in moderate food insecurity, which are the two measures we have. And within Latin America is in South America. We are not observing those levels uh, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa of change because of, of COVID-19. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other question? Uh, yes, please. Uh, Lisa, Lisa, I see yes. you. I yes. See you waving. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I have one question and one comment. Uh, to the previous uh, speakers. And my question first is to Dr. Volker de Meulen, Meulen who uh, proposed to set up an international scientific advisory committee. Uh, I think this is a very interesting proposal, but my thinking about it, I wonder how, how do you see such an international scientific advisory panel uh, coexist with all these kind of, of the international or national scientific panels and experts that almost every nation have today to advise the governments. Should this be an overarching advisory panel or should it be free from all the others? That's just my thinking right now. And the comment is that I do really agree with Dr. Robin 
fears from the ESAC that there is an urgent need to revise the European regulations so that new plant breeding techniques such as the Nobel Prize winner of 2020, the CRISPR-Cas9, can be further developed and used also in agriculture and not only in, in medicine as it stands today in EU. Uh, so those were my two comments. Thank you. Thank you. Very important comments. Uh, Volker, would you like to begin? Uh, well, I think I would like to start, but I also would like to invite yeah. him to comment as well. Yeah. I think what we noticed yeah. Yeah. was... Close it. Can you hear Close. me? Do your shoes have it. Yeah. Can you hear me? Go ahead. Okay. I think what we noticed... Yes, we can. Yes. ...in our studies, of course, that there is a tremendous diversity if it comes to science advice to this major topic. And as uh, Lisa just said, you know, already uh, correctly, I mean, there are so many groups and there is no coordination in, in giving this advice. And I would say it would be good to have something, I would say like the IPCC, where you have a, a, a group which is doing something which is coordinated. I think the coordination is the most important part as it comes to science advice. And not that, that you have this, this dispersed numbers of group and in particular for the governments, they, they have to get some sort of a united voice and not that they can pick the individual scientific advice they, they need personally and ignore all the others. But maybe Joachim is much more on this uh, topic uh, or closer to the copies than I am. Joachim? Well, Chair, if you want me to chip in. It's yeah, please do. Lisa, it's precisely because of what you said. There are so many committees at national level, self-appointed groups at international level and councils and so on. Um, but there are also some with legitimacy, like the uh, Committee on Food Security has a high level panel, but it's far too small. Um, if we compare it with the tens of thousands of scientists mobilized around the climate agenda, we have nothing like that on the complex food system. Um, it's for the first time with this food system summit that we uh, are uh, in the process of mobilizing science at scale that relates to the complexities of food, nutrition, and agriculture. And um, this structure would need to have a clearly defined relationship on how it interacts with policy so that it gives independent um, science-based advice and is not captured by any political entity. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Robin, would you like to address the question of Chris Pakas? Well, well just to say thank you for, for, for your comments, which, which obviously I uh, welcome the support. Uh, yeah, I mean, we still have a problem in, in, in Europe it's a legacy of, of the old GMO problem, which is now uh, spilt over into CRISPR-Cas. Um, cu currently, um, the, the European courts uh, consider that Chris genome editing falls within the remit of the GMO regulation. I, I think some of you would join me in disagreeing with that. Um, what, what's happening is that we're waiting for the European Commission, in, in theory, at the end of this month, um, to give further advice to Parliament and to the Council of Ministers. Um, the topic is still controversial. It, my, myself, I don't think it will be resolved in, in the short term, which is a great problem for, for Europe, for, for us, because there's a negative feedback, obviously, on, on, on innovation, um, but, but also on our science base. We lose um, some, some of the interest in our uh, plant science skills in consequence. So, so really my warning is to everybody else, don't repeat the mistakes that we're making in Europe. Thank you. But I think the, I think the question, Robin, is that, uh, have the scientists really explained pretty well the difference between CRISPR technology well. and this new genomics and the GMO? Because uh, many scientists tend to think that this is just like fast, normal breeding, but doing yeah. it in a fast yeah. way. Has this been explained well enough by the scientists in Europe? Yeah. I, I mean, you're, you're right, Mohammed. Um, I, I think many in the scientific community in Europe have tried to, to explain the difference. 
uh, between the modern genomic based uh, techniques and the previous ones. Um, of course, many scientists in, in Europe also don't think that there should be over regulation of, of GMOs. And we had the example of golden rice right at the beginning. Um, that these two are, are, are safe uh, and a benefit to society. So, so the problem is a long standing one. But, but, but as you say, it, it's complicated at the moment by the difficulty uh, in explaining to parts of the public uh, that the difference between different techniques and, and, and the implications. Um, it, it's also the case that um, crop plant regulation in, in Europe it is quite unlike the way that we regulate a lot of other things, a lot of other innovation in Europe. Uh, for, for example, it, it, in medicines, we, we regulate the product, not the technology, whereas crop breeding has always been regulated according to the technology. Uh, rather than the characteristics of the product itself. But that seems a, a, you know, rather a paradox. Uh, and we are trying to change that. Um, but, but it has been going on for, for, for a long while. And I don't think we will see change soon, unfortunately. Mohammed, there are three, Thank you. Mohammed, there are three hands up. It is uh, David Silva, Boris Nigli, and Marcelo Sanchez Serondo have their hand raised. Yes, okay. So who is first? Uh, David Silverman. Okay, please I'm go ahead. Your, I'm your assistant. Uh, Perfect. Thank you so okay. much. Okay. Oh, this, this is, is a fantastic. Yeah. I, I'm really, uh, really privileged to be here. It's a great uh, meeting. And I'm really excited about the emphasis on uh, uh, preventing uh, hunger and, uh, and thinking about developing of uh, scientific uh, of something like the IPCC for food. But we have to recognize that both the, the, the IPCC, the acceptance of climate change and acceptance of modern biotechnology encounter a lot of obstacles. So I think that we also need to think about a global effort to enhance a acceptance of science given the limitation of science. I think that uh, to some extent, uh, the opportunity that we have a lot of organizations outside of science working for science, we really need to enhance uh, scientific education and, uh, and, and uh, building a capability in order to solve uh, problems. I think yeah. the challenge of food is not only to provide food, but to prevent situations that uh, prevent having food. For example, yeah. dealing with issues of uh, peace and dealing with issues of lack of skills. So to, yeah. to, my, to my feeling is a key element of uh, our uh, new thinking about food is to develop excellence in developing countries and around the world that every country will be leading some sort of re uh, research along uh, this area and developing better understanding of science which means huge investment in education so the resistance for a lot of the scientific solution will be reduced. Thank you for this Thank opportunity. You. Thank you very much. Um, Igno, I don't see your hand. Igno? Um, no? 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 Then Marcelo? Um, Marcelo and then Boris. Yeah. So, um, to come back to the idea of Aristotle that the food is for the soul, not only for the body. Uh, what can, and also the idea of, of his Excellency Monsieur Gallagher to speak about education. What is your project to have, a, a, in some sense, a, a direct, a direct uh, uh, the fund of that we have of the money that come from the food? What can we do to have a direct uh, relation with education of already? Uh, education for for the agriculture, so 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 directly connection between the money that we have by the food and the education for the food. So I propose this in maybe in in, in the conclusion that put something in relation directly to education. Okay, very good, very good. What is uh, Thank you very much, uh, Mohammed. Although I'm uh, very much in favor of combining uh, 
agroecological farming systems and together with new technologies, especially uh, the, 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 the latest uh, breeding technology, I think that's very important. But uh, I, I wonder, I think that so far in our work of the, of the scientific group, we haven't really, we haven't been able to integrate also the economic and social uh, challenges we have. So uh, His Excellency Cardinal Turkson uh, sp spoke about poverty and economic constraints, uh, uh, not having access to food. So all these aspects uh, need to be better integrated also in the work of the scientific group. And we should think, we should think about that, how we could uh, integrate that better. I don't know, Joachim, what is your opinion on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Joachim, do you want to quickly respond? We're happy to elaborate on that uh, more at, in our next uh, meeting of the scientific group. but. Uh, yeah. Um, I really appreciate, let me uh, draw on the statements uh, from uh, Cardinal Torxen, who uh, surprised me with a statement on finance. We are currently working with a group uh, of advisors on how to finance the uh, agenda for the Food System Summit. Um, we need innovative mechanisms of finance, not just development aid. We need, okay. to, we need to call on the um, uh, International Monetary Fund to do to the food system what they do for the climate agenda, they mobilize special drawing rights in order to uh, mobilize large scale financing. Then uh, next week we have a group of uh, modelers who look really at the opportunities uh, to, to invest in different parts of uh, the food system. Uh, in order to achieve uh, the goals of the Food System Summit. So uh, our subgroup of four modelers, Maximo, Tom Hertel, Frank Ebert, and, uh, and Mario, uh, will um, not only entertain, but challenge us next week. Thank you. Okay, Ismahan, you seem to be the last one. Thank you very much, Mohammed. Uh, actually, I'm really glad to hear us talking about inequalities because really, that's really the source of the problem. So if we cut inequalities, we will really make big strides in terms of international yeah. development and ending hunger and poverty. And that's where really I'm glad that all the speakers uh, agree that science and technology is a must. It's an accelerator okay. that we need to use it. Uh, and I want to just uh, connect with what the DG of FAO said. We have in the new strategic framework, science, innovation, and data as accelerator. So it, it is, I think we all know what the issue is and what we need to focus on is how could we influence policy and regulation to let these things really be adopted at a scale and maybe bring in the dichotomies. I mean, if you agree that you have a vaccine in you that is based on new technology, MM, MMRN, how could you disagree to have a plant that has been crossed and selected using genetic uh, methodologies? <clears throat> so those dichotomies, I think, are very important to bring up. The way we deal with health should be rather more restricted than than the other way around, than agriculture, whereas what we are seeing right now in the regulatory frameworks is that we are very strict with agriculture because of the GMO story. So it's, it's very important that we bring and communicate much, much better and bring in those dichotomies so people see that if, if you are agreeing to use a technology to, in your health as pills or vaccine or whatever, you should be very open to use it in agriculture as well. Particularly, it's only with science we could bridge the gap of yield in, in least income countries. Only with science, we can really increase the productivity with less input, which is very important for climate change adaptation. Over to you, Mohammed. thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Mahan. Um, the, the Director General actually spoke also 
um, very nicely about this science policy interface, which is absolutely critical uh, when it comes to food systems. Uh, but I'm, I'm really wondering whether you know of uh, any of your member countries that has a viable and uh, coherent national food systems policy. I know there are policies in agriculture in various other sectors, but is there a national policy for food systems that you have come across because it can be a, an example or a model for other countries? Uh, I might give you one example from my home country, Morocco, where uh, there is the, they adopted a value chain with the green plan about 10 years ago. And that's what they try to do. It's really uh, develop better partnership between small holders and, and uh, big companies, but also look at the value chain approach and see how it can develop the whole country. And maybe I'll pass it on to Maximo. Maybe he can give us... Uh, uh, an example of a, a food system policy approach. Sorry, Maximo, to put you on the line on, on the spot. <laughs> no, but but I think uh, to to be honest, uh, I don't think that we have uh, still uh, countries that have implemented comprehensive what we call agri food systems or food system approaches. Uh, this is a this is a, a concept that normally has been. Uh, treated in silos and not in an integrated form. Even just the concept of, of trade-offs is a concept that we are starting to, to try to, to measure and came up as a result of what is being done in the summit. Uh, of course, there has been previous uh, exercises to try to measure trade-offs, but in a comprehensive way, it's very difficult to, to identify and that's central to be able to understand uh, and to be able to build a comprehensive policy on food systems. But given that I have the floor, just one, one minute, I will do one little question that, that, that I have in my mind, which is related to education, which was mentioned uh, by Marcel and by others, uh, and by also by Professor Silverman. Uh, the concern to me is the level of asymmetry of information we live today because of the huge inequalities in education. It is what is leading to rejection of certain technologies that could help to resolve certain problems. Now, of course, we can build up education, but that will take time and we should be doing that. The problem is, and the question is, how we can innovate in the way we bring this new information to reduce this asymmetry so that better decisions are made and people understand better what this decision mean. And we don't have to wait two generations to be able to do it. Of course, we have to push education, but also we're in an urgency because of the levels of hunger and and numbers that we are facing uh, to do it quicker. So what type of innovation we can do to, to, to start to shorten that, that asymmetry of information, which for me is one of the major reasons why uh, many of these technologies and science-based technologies are not moving. And a simple example is what is happening today in terms of vaccination and the degree of people which is rejecting vaccinating themselves mm -hmm. because of lack of proper information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very important point. Uh, okay, I think uh, we are almost done. Uh, um, uh, uh, Joachim, Joachim, uh, Mohamed, now, uh, I, I, I turn to you. No, Mohamed, uh, we had a hand up from Ingo Potri, because Ingo, Sorry? Potri, Ingo, In Ingo. Ingo, Ingo, where are you? Ingo. If he still wants to take the floor. Okay, you can speak. Do, do, let do, let very welcome, Ingo, but I don't see you. I have a small screen. I, yeah, I don't see any. On, on top. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. go ahead, go ahead, please. If I may add a short comment, um, just to the point of education. This is far too low. Instead, we need politicians with backbone. It would be far faster. To the point uh, we have heard that we should also consider the effect of European attitudes and decisions to the rest of the world. It is totally neglected that the European attitude is extremely badly affecting the politics in European countries. Um, to the question of uh, new breeding technologies, I advise to believe that uh, gen gene editing is only good and genetic engineering is only bad. 
I think both are important technologies which complement each other, and we should not forget to use both of them. For genetic engineering, we have 20 years of data which shows beyond any doubt that this is safe technology. We should finally accept it. For gene editing, we can expect a similar situation. So my plea is use technologies which have been proven effect, which can help and forget about ideologies in this case. Thank you. Thank you very much for these uh, comments. Uh, okay, you're welcome. Um, I now turn to you. If you okay. can kindly give us your conclusions, conclusions of the day. Thank you. Well, um, let me first thank you, Mohammed. Um, it's not easy to uh, direct a, a global panel from Khartoum, but you masterly did that. That's true. <laughs> and, uh, thank you for that. Um, I want to uh, add my words of thanks to uh, all colleagues who have spoken, presented, um, um, and um, uh, let's let's recall what Werner Aber started out with, um, with his long-term uh, perspective uh, on uh, combining uh, the issues of um, uh, evolution, um, protecting uh, biodiversity and modern science. Um, um, we uh, had also a beautiful example of how science uh, can make a big difference. Basic science can make a, a big difference to make plant protection uh, more sustainable. Um, uh, that uh, uh, I think uh, uh, is uh, uh, a wonderful uh, uh, experience to see how basic science moves to the center of uh, uh, solving problems. Um, um, Archbishop uh, Gallagher's uh, five points resonated strongly with all of us uh, from uh, the dignity point, which uh, Marcelo had made uh, also. Um, but uh, I found it particularly interesting uh, uh, to hear uh, from you, uh, Monsignor, the focus on agriculture and the small farmers. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, which you emphasized, um, and the conflict resolution aspects. Uh, I think that's where the faith-based uh, communities and science need to move together. Science cannot, uh, so it uh, doesn't have many concepts to solve conflicts. Uh, um, uh, development, uh, which we can facilitate, can solve conflicts, but that's where um, the formats of dialogue need to come in. Um, uh, Director General Chu uh, emphasized the key role of science policy and uh, of new science uh, in order to address uh, the situation of uh, food systems on the decline. Um, Agnes Kalibata really gave us um, enriched terms of reference to the scientific group. I'm sure colleagues on the scientific group, you listened carefully to her. Um, and. Uh, that um, we need to um, imagine um, uh, a sustainable food system and work towards this uh, with uh, uh, a bold, ambitious, but doable uh, science-based agenda. And that's what the UN Secretary General asked us to do. And um, uh, we need to find ways to uh, aggregate all our beautiful ideas into a do doable program that uh, captures the imagination of uh, heads of state and uh, uh, is not uh, uh, bringing us into the awkward situation that we tell lots of beautiful stories and examples, uh, but they don't see a strategic base in it. Uh, Cardinal Turkson, uh, um, you asked the fundamental question on how is it possible that we still have this hunger? Uh, and uh, uh, you gave answers and you didn't shy away from asking for the money uh, because uh, ending hunger and overcoming the food systems problems requires large scale investment. But the financing uh, is uh, 
uh, is needed, but and we should not lose sight on the faces, seeing into the faces of hungry people, uh, rather and, and just talk about science and technology. Colleagues, this was a rambling um, conclusion of today. Tomorrow, um, we will have to focus more on um, all aspects of science. Um, uh, beyond the genomics and genetics and to bioscience. Um, we need to employ uh, different uh, uh, domains of science. We need to focus more on the issues of climate risk and climate threats. Uh, we need to focus more on the issues of uh, lack of uh, safe food and uh, transboundary issues. Uh, and uh, the opportunities of nutrition will be on the agenda. So. Uh, with uh, these few remarks, uh, I, I want to especially thank uh, all speakers and discussion partners again uh, for their wonderful contributions and uh, hope to see you tomorrow. Sorry for drawing over by 11 minutes. Uh, wherever you are in the world, uh, good evening, good day. Uh, see you tomorrow and thanks to our hosts here in the Vatican. Hey, bye bye. See you tomorrow. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye bye. See you all tomorrow. Bye bye. Bye bye.